and original. From Story Studio Network. Well, here we go. It is the 13th day of June 2024. And I'm calling it the Cold War edition of Now and Next. This is the flagship podcast for Story Studio Network. You can hear I got the head cold going on. Flirted with the idea of putting it off. But you know what? A couple of things came up this week. And had the opportunity to track down a couple of really insightful guests um, on stories I don't think we're talking enough about right now. One is all about continental security here in North America. We are literally under the gun as we speak. Mm -hmm. That's one. Two G7 is meeting. There was a conference here in Toronto this week as well. And on both cases, the conversation was is focusing on, not primarily, but significantly, on how we prepare for a second Trump presidency. How does that affect us here in Canada? How does it affect the G7? How does it affect NATO? So we're going to get into that, both of them. And, uh, well, you know, we're lucky enough to have the A-list guests on this. And we begin with the scary notion and fact that the Russians are in our backyard. Well, that sounds joyful. And in fact, it was supposed to be. This is the theme music from a 1966 film produced and directed by Toronto's own Norman Jewison, the late Norman Jewison. Featured Alan Arkin. And, oh, uh, you know, I think Jonathan Winters was in that movie. You know, 1966. And it was funny. It was supposed to be funny. The Russians are coming. Well, they have arrived. Here we are in 2024, and this kind of just caught my eye uh, maybe two nights ago. And uh, I thought, why the hell aren't we hearing more about this? Very vivid pictures and video of Russian submarines off the coast of uh, Cuba, some 90 miles away from the United States. And then there was even... Video of the Russians in Moscow boasting about it. What a great thing it was to be in America's backyard. So, as soon as I saw it, I fired off a note to Major General Scott Clancy. He's retired from the RCAF here after a 37 year career. Uh, sat in the chair as the deputy commander in the Alaskan NORAD region, also as the director of operations for all of NORAD in Colorado Springs. W what's going on at NORAD this morning? as we watch these pictures. That they're doing all sorts of assessments and characterizations, but they're watching the Russians in Cuba very closely. Uh, thanks for having me on, Dave. Uh, yeah, so what NORAD headquarters will be doing and has been doing for the days leading up to, whether they got indications of this coming or not, uh, it would be interesting to know from their intelligence, but they've been tracking this, you know, I would say for weeks now, as the transit was made from their home ports up in the Northern fleet through the GI UK gap, which is that gap you hop between Iceland, uh, the Greenland and, and uh, the United Kingdom. They would have tracked these vessels coming through there, handed off from NATO and US uh, European command to US Northern command, which is the same headquarters as NORAD. So, so Canada is intimately involved here in the tracking of these vessels, uh, and has been for a lot of, lot of days. So what would be going on every day? The commander would be getting, you know, daily updates. And then if anything out of the ordinary happened, there would be specific updates, uh, pertaining to those vessels 
especially the Kazan uh, submarine. So how long is that voyage? How long would it take for that sub to make its way to Cuba? Uh, probably take it uh, approximately a week to a week and a half to make that voyage. Now, all of that depends. So you heard from the Russian uh, you know, foreign ministry and defense ministry that they're conducting exercises out in the Atlantic. <laughs> so surface vessels, and that, this fleet is, so you've got the Admiral Gorshkov, which is a cruise missile, uh, guided cruise missile frigate, as well as uh, a tanker, a couple support vessels and a tug. So it's a pretty sizable surface fleet. But then you have the subsurface, you know, the Kazan submarine as well. When, when they come across, they're doing exercises out in the middle of the Atlantic, and they're also probably, and especially the Kazan submarine, doing exercises to approach the U.S. and Canadian uh, mainland silently to conduct, uh, you know, simulated attacks on North America. So they're, they're testing weaknesses. Is that what they're doing? Ab- absolutely. So, for example, it's a very large ocean. Once that submarine goes through the GIUK gap, it's very, very difficult to track. And the U.S., uh, NATO forces and Canada anti-submarine warfare assets would be out there. That submarine is trying to avoid all of that. And the whole idea w- about their trajectory, how much time it took, the drills, a lot is going to be about how much they can avoid detection and what they can see from the Canadian and U.S. NORAD response. So we're all submarine experts because we watched Sean Connery and Hunt for Red October. <laughs> so <laughs> who's got the upper hand here? The Russians do. Yeah. Absolutely the Russians do. When you're trying to avoid detection in an ocean that large, once you move through the straits of the GIUK gap, even if you have a submarine right in your tail, it's very, very difficult to maintain that contact. And there's tons of things that a submarine wishing to avoid detection can do to drop that tail. And as, as much as we think that it's just a scientific thing, it is not. It's an absolute art form that the Americans, the British, the Dutch, the Germans, you know, all of these people have been involved in this business and the Russians for years. They know how to do this. So the Russians have the upper hand at avoiding detection. So, you know, back to NORAD, the, the commander's getting daily updates. What What is happening proactively here? I mean, is there, there's a threat here. There's no question. This isn't just about patting ourselves on the back and, you know, thumbing the nose at the Americans. There's There's got to be purpose behind this. So absolutely. Uh, what the Pentagon has reported is that there are American uh, surface vessels in the anti-submarine warfare role, as well as patrol aircraft that are monitoring the surface vessels, the Admiral Gorshkov frigate, as well as searching for and m- monitoring the approach of the submarine. Now, they're not saying anything more than that, nor would they, because then they'd be giving away, you know, the, the details that the commander down in Colorado Springs is providing uh, to both Canadian and American uh, governments as to the approach of these vessels uh, to North America and what their specific activities are. So, yeah, there's a lot of threat here. There's, I would say, a significant amount of preparation as well as detailed plans that would go about this. And it's not going to end just because they're in Cuba. Monitoring of that in and around Cuba, uh, some of the vessels I've heard are, you know, going on to Venezuela. This is all going to be very important very importantly and closely monitored by NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM. So, you know, I, I we jokingly started with the, the theme music from, you know, the 1966 movie, and it was a comedy. I mean, th- to think about it, at, at the time, it was it was okay to laugh at the Cold War, and, and it made sense. But it wasn't that far removed from the October crisis, which this is kind of what we're talking about in, in June of, of 2024. There are nuclear capabilities off the coast of the United States. Yeah, so, you know, I think I might characterize a little bit differently, David, and and I think that we overstate the nuclear uh, piece to this. First of all, let's all divide out nuclear-powered and nuclear-armed are two fundamentally different Mm -hmm. things. Most, you know, very large vessels and submarines, because of the quietness of it, uh, you know, are nuclear-powered. I do not believe that you're seeing nuclear weapons on board uh, any of these, well, especially the two, the Admiral Gorshkov surface vessel uh, and its cruise missiles. Although they're capable of, I don't believe they're carrying it. And it's the same with the submarine. But I don't think that's the threat. And I have not, even in my time as the Director of Operations for NORAD, thought that the specific threat was nuclear-based. It's the conventional threat. The, the real threat that a, a wave of cruise missiles could come at North America, all conventional taking out a significant amount of targets, crippling 
you know, uh, American and Canadian economic and electrical infrastructure elements. That's the real threat here. But the specific role of this fleet that's moving, has moved to Cuba and has conducted operations off the East Coast is strategic messaging to Canada, but especially the United States. It's in part response to the Americans uh, taking off their limitations with respect to uh, the targeting of homeland Russia by weapon systems that they've provided to Ukraine. Now, this this is common for what, not just Putin, but all uh, of the, the you know past Russian activities is that they use their strategic forces, their strategic bombers, which approach our coastlines and our Arctic all the time and have deployed to Cuba and Venezuela in the past, you know, similarly to what you're seeing with these vessels. So they use these strategic strategic forces that can carry nuclear weapons, but also can carry conventional weapons to send a specific message. And that message is, hey, you're messing in our backyard in Ukraine. That's our backyard. To us, we kind of see this as being crazy. Of course, Ukraine should pound Russia. Russia, unprovocated, you know, attacked them and has been massacring their civilians ever since. So to us, we might see that as a tit for tat. They see this as, you know, a, a war of liberation for the people of Ukraine. So, so it's a very different message that the Russians are trying to send. And they're sending that straight to the United States hierarchy. I don't want to be glib about this, but, you know, we got our, our, our shorts in a knot over the weather balloons from China, and it was clear at the time that, you know, whether it was an intelligence or a military failure, I don't know, but that was the narrative around it. Was this a failure of intelligence to, 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 to see this happen without any kind of, uh, you know, action prior to them arriving? So so that I, I'm going to step back. You know, I was intimately involved, as you know, in that balloon looking at the the Chinese. So, you know, I take apart the weather balloons and some of the reactions after that on w what may or may not have been, you know, weather balloons. But the reaction to the Chinese balloon, I, I think was pretty astute in that I don't want anybody knowing what my capabilities are or when I know about you. So I'm not going to report that to the media until it becomes obvious or until it's a threat to the general population. Now, when I carry this on to the failure in intelligence here, I don't think so. We don't know when NATO, the United States, Canada, at the highest levels of security, knew about this, uh, you know, impending movement of these vessels. They definitely would have seen them leaving port. They definitely would see them coming through the GIUK gap. So, so to me, I, you know, I think it's part and parcel of the the daily thing. I don't think there's any failure in intelligence here. The other message that's coming along loud and clear here is testing of vulnerabilities. You know, if you're going to poke at especially American military capability, you're poking at something that's extremely potent. The problem is, is it's not potent in the continental United States. It's designed to fight the away game overseas. So by coming at North America, you're coming at a place that's not highly defended. You know, we, we think about the cruise missiles that are on these two vessels and you think about that raid that Iran did, whether it was theater or not, on Israel, you know, 300 plus missiles, all, all defended, like a very small thin veneer getting through. If that happened in North America, almost all of them would have gotten through and attacked their targets. There's no protective dome over the United States. Or Canada. Yeah. At all. And that, and when we talk about deficiencies in NORAD and, 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 this is all about trying to beef up our overseas deployments to make sure that the Russians don't do this. The message the Russians are saying is we're coming straight at your heartland, straight at the homeland, and we're going to do that first. Okay. Well, that was optimistic. Um, so, <laughs> um, during your service with NORAD in, in Colorado Springs and Alaska, uh, you would have had intimate experience with the, the, the Trump administration. From your perspective and looking at what's going on right now, Russia's at the doorstep. We've got the vulnerabilities you talk about continentally. And Trump, you know, it's a pretty good shot of going back to the White House. Is the United States more dangerous place if Trump wins or Trump loses? Sift through the entrails for us on that. Yeah, so you ask a fantastic question uh, with respect to, you know, is the United States more dangerous? And, you know, you'd have to qualify to who and, right. and in what context, right? Okay, a few things that I know. 
Uh, I, I watched, you know, President Trump bring on when he started his generals and all these people, including Jim Mattis, you know, and I have a Legion of Merit from the United States signed by the Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis. Uh, the warrior monk he garners an enormous amount of respect. This is a very seasoned military professional who, you know, has now been vilified by, by Mr. Trump. I think the world is a much more dangerous place, but is so much more volatile because of an individual who is unpredictable in the White House. I don't, I, I don't understand the logic and I don't think anyone could because it is so individually based. You know, the, his relationship with North Korea and then how that falls apart is all based upon his personal interactions with you know, that. That doesn't, that doesn't bode well. So there's no coherence. I don't think there's really any coherence. Now, the other part that's dangerous here, and, and I think it's, we got to watch this in Canadian politics too. Every time you see divisatory politics, every single time you see it, these are not the, the politics of collaboration, of consensus, of moving forward with the right thing. Because in the end, when, when we get pushed into corners, we all say, hey, what's the right thing to do? And we all agree on what the right thing to do is. It's the politics that end up dividing us. And this is why I like, you know, anything other than a Trump administration. And the, the divisatory way in which Republican and Democrat has, has parsed out inside the United States could be as, as dangerous if they lose. But I think the danger if they lose is internal. Mm -hmm. That there's some real internal things. Now that could spill over if, if this goes very, very poorly for the United States, like a stable, uh, economically and politically United States is very good for Canada. The other side is really problematic. To me, the turning point was when the president of the United States in 2019 issued a decree, signed a, sorry, issued a decree. What do they call it? Executive signed order. an executive yeah. order that armed that ordered the Department of National of Defense of the United States to arm, you know, put military forces on the northern border. That meant that my commander in Alaska at the time was going to be given the task of arming, putting armed troops on the Canadian Alaskan border under his command. And I told him very clearly the day that that order gets sent through, I will submit my resignation and in an open letter state to my forces that they should all get out of, of the United States, because this is the end of any cooperative agreement. How can you have a military agreement, but you've got military forces arming your border? I'm sorry, that, that, that is incongruent with respect to what allies do. So that's kind of typifying to me, the kind of isolationist and individualist thing you'd have with the Trump administration. I, I, I'm not saying that Joe Biden is a much better choice, but I'll tell you what he does do. He surrounds himself with a team. I'm going to put Kamala Harris over on a side for a second because I, I think that she's been underperforming significantly as a vice president. And I think they would, they would have benefited from Joe Biden being a vice president, maybe a stronger president, right? Just because he has all of the connections you'd want from a vice president. But I think that he surrounds himself with a great team. And I look at Anthony Blinken and the work that he's done in the Middle East, trying to, you know, calm all of these things since, uh, you know, the October uh, crisis in, in Gaza. And so I, I think that there is a better element of team there. And, and I think that you'd see in the Trump administration, a team that would be fleeting because you'd never know when you'd be kicked out, when you'd lose favor with that, that, that individual. So is there an opportunity here to just sort of, buckle in and get ready for a rough ride or or is there do you, do you view an opportunity here to actually prepare um prophylactically for a trump presidency absolutely the the latter and i think that the essence of all diplomatic relations in any instance is no matter how much you dislike the individuals or even the administration so we go with putin the worst thing we can do is cut diplomatic ties with russia the answer is you want to keep those diplomatic ties open. We have to go back to our Cold War things here. It's not about isolate. You speak with your enemies even more when you're in crisis than you do when you're not. So in terms of, you know, I think of the letter from, you know, the U.S. politicians to uh, the prime minister. The answer is, okay, well, let's engage them. The thing I like about you know, some of the Canadian politics is no matter who's yelling at us, we're talking right back. And the answer is we're not going to walk away from any tables. We're not going to, you know, huffing away and isolate ourselves. 
first of all, we can't economically and politically. We're tied to so many places. We're a, a trading nation. We're, we're, we're not, you know, a, a produce our own kind of nation. And I think we, we need to stand on that is that that's what, where power is going to be w within the world. I, I think that preparing ourselves for a possible Trump administration is about saying, these are all the things that Canadians care about. And this is what's common between us and the United States. This is where we want to go economically. I think we'd have to prepare for a renegotiation of USMCA uh, or whatever the Canadian, whatever we call them, that series of acronyms in which the, the new NAFTA, I think we have to prepare ourselves for how that's going to look with NORAD. You know, there was a reason why we never went out and renegotiated the NORAD agreement uh, anytime during the Trump administration. It's be, you know, significantly because I think he would have walked away from it. And, and I think that having more conversations, not less, is what's going to be important with, uh, with the Trump administration especially. Scott Clancy, thanks for joining us. It's great to have your firsthand insights on so much of this. And, 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 and again, we're not here to raise alarm bells, but I just don't, I'm not sure we're talking enough about it. Yeah, no, I, I think that it's important. When we think about continental defense and deterrence, we have to have a solid deterrent. The movement of these vessels, the strategic messaging, how that relates to international politics and, and a new Trump administration, these are important things. Major General retired from the RCAF, and uh, the book is called Developing Coaching Leaders. So you can find that at uh, scottclancy.ca. Scottclancy.ca. .ca. Very good. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much for having me, Dave. All right, and our conversation with Scott Clancy didn't end there. We had a little bit more time to talk, and we got into this uh, discussion about the pressures on Ottawa to increase Canadian spending in its contribution to NATO. So what I'm going to do here is, actually, we've got two podcast episodes for you this week, a little bit of now and next extra. So watch the feed. It'll be in there. And Scott gives the best five-minute explanation of why Ottawa is not spending money to increase its contribution to NATO. Yeah. Anyway, watch your feed. That's on the way. In the meantime, we uh, had the opportunity, you know, oftentimes to talk to David Schultz. David is the um, legal expert that we often go to in the United States. He's a professor of political science and constitutional law at Hamlin University. And a lot has gone on since the last time I talked to David. But again, let's go back to that conversation we just had with General Clancy. And that is the question of a Trump presidency. What does that mean in terms of the security of North America, never mind the world? But also, how do other countries prepare for it? Now, let's just dial back a little bit. It's not that long ago, like two weeks maybe, Donald Trump was convicted of 34 felony counts. Sentencing to come. And, you know, I don't know where you picked that story up because I suggested to David... I don't know that you can pick the story up because it never feels like this story is ever really, really going to end. If I were going to write a story, let's say, a political fiction and say a candidate is running for president facing 91 criminal charges, gets convicted, the public opinion polls don't seem to suggest that they care one way or the other, and he still might want to win the presidency. You would think as the editor of the publishing house, what a what a lousy novel. Uh, and and probably just reject it. But you know, was it but sometimes fiction what was fiction is stranger than reality or something like that? Or reality is stranger than fiction, I guess, like that. And that's where we are. And, and think about it right now. Uh, I had some people talking to me within a couple of days after the conviction, and they said, so what impact do you think this will have on the presidential election? And I said, right now, none, um, or minimal. Um, and what we were almost two weeks out, the polls are suggesting micro, very, very small shift, maybe, maybe helping Biden, but all within the margin of error. And we're still, what, six months away from the election? Who knows what else could happen at this point? The economy could continue to be bad. 
Um, the war in Gaza could escalate. So on one level, his conviction changed everything and changed nothing. Yeah, and, and you know, when you talk about the economy and, 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 the, and how that's perceived, I mean, every time I open up, you know, the, the stories on the economy, well, we're creating more jobs and, you know, the inflation has come back down and everything else. Uh, but on the ground, people are looking at what's right in front of them, the cost of their living, the cost of their groceries, the cost of their gasoline to drive the cost of their car. And that seems to be ingrained. And that's a lagging indicator, if you will, it may, maybe, you know, because people are still feeling the effects of what happened to them six months ago when, yes. you know, th- they didn't get the raise they thought they were going to get or their mortgage rate went up because of inflation, all of those sorts of things. So it, to be for the White House to stand out and say, yeah, but, you know, we've created all these great jobs and look how well we're doing in the economy and the inflation's come back down. We're still coping. People are still coping with the economic realities of six and eight months ago. Right. And I'm going to add to it, and not just six, eight months ago, but if we look at after the last, let's say, let's just say even from the beginning of the pandemic, but I can maybe shift the time frame here, is that uh, wages have gone up, but not as quickly as has inflation has gone up. And so, yeah, um, people m- might be making a couple more you know, dollars, but as you pointed out there, um, they're actually in a little bit worse situation now than they were two or three or four years ago, because Bread, milk, gas, um, or I don't know if it's true, like in Canada, um, in July, you know, it's um, the biggest shopping expenses that start occur are the back to school stuff. You know, that parents are going to go off buying what jeans, shoes, you know, whatever it may be like that. And that's not going to be cheap. And so the public, I think, rightly is saying, yeah, I'm not as well off as I was a few years ago. And I hate to use the old Ronald Reagan line. Remember where he asked at one point, are you better off now than you were four years ago? For many Americans, the answer is no. The other way I approach it, I did a piece recently, and it was called The Streets of America. Wall Street's doing great. Wall Street's going gangbusters. Main Street, which refers to like mom and pop businesses, they're, they're okay, but struggling. But if I call Elm Street, Elm Street to be the place where people live, mortgage rates are up. People who want to buy a house, um, it's harder to buy a house right now. That's the stuff that they see. And they're blaming the president correctly or incorrectly for that. Well, and also what I'm also hearing when you hear some of the interviews with, you know, some of the the, the voters who are going to make a difference in this, whether they're independents or uh, those who might have supported Nikki Haley, for example, in the Republican right. race, they're looking at Trump and saying, you know, when I look back, he actually got stuff done, and I'm pretty comfortable and happy with that. Again, that's a distorted lens as well, because of a lot course. of that was done prior to the pandemic, and they're completely blind to all of the chaos that went on clearly and don't seem to care. It's it's right. the what's happening to me right now in my daily life, and how can I get that? And, I, and oddly enough, he seems to be, you know, given the, 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 the choices – I'm probably better off going back to him. Yeah, no, you're right at this point, is that there is a certain amount of what rose-colored, a halcyon view for, for, for the Trump administration. People forget that really after he gets to, does the tax cuts, you know, in his first year in office, he really didn't accomplish very much. I mean, his record was not great. I mean, yeah, you hear people talk about, well, he addressed the border crisis issue. Not really. Uh, so... And he alienated a lot of our allies, including, you know, um, Canada. Um, So there is an awful lot being discounted. But what people, again, are seeing is their pocketbook. It's their, get. like I said, on a day-to-day basis, when people go to the, you know, to get gas and go to the grocery store. And again, as I'm going to suggest here, when they, in July and early August, go and buy kids' clothing for school, it's going to be the ouch factor at this point. And they're saying, well, you know, I don't remember it being that bad under Trump. Yeah, he was a problem. Yeah, he did all this kind of stuff, you know, but I don't feel like I was struggling. So there's, even though they were, so it's short memory. And people say in politics, what is it? The time horizon for politics for memory, you know, is what a nanosecond or something like that. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. And, and Biden doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. He, he's not dynamic. Uh, When you see him speak, he just does not project himself as being a leader or in control. And he keeps talking about all the great things that he's done. 
but on a day-to-day basis, people aren't seeing it. Yeah. And, and you, you gotta, again, we go back to where we started. Everybody is more concerned with what's going on at the kitchen table. If yeah. I really have to be worried about something, that's what I'm worried about. And in terms of what I really need to get through day to day, sort of drives that, I won't call it willful ignorance, but there's a willingness to say, okay, this is happening over there and it's just not my problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is psychologist, what psychologist Abraham Maslow talked all about this concept of the hierarchy of needs that, that we have to worry about our basic physiological um, needs, like, you know, food, clothing, shelter, things like that, before we can worry about a next level. And for many people, they're stuck at that lower level. I mean, to get to the point where you start to think in terms of saying, let's think about politics. Let's think about the geopolitical situation 10,000 miles away. It's almost crazy to think about that for people who, again, who are on a day-to-day basis worried about getting up, going to work, sending their kids to school, uh, how they're going to pay the the doctor bill or something like that, I can perfectly well understand why they're not convinced that what happens in in Ukraine or or let's say the the um, the, um in Ch- in the like between Taiwan and Ch- Taiwan and China et cetera et cetera why they should care and when Trump speaks bringing it back to Trump what he has done very successfully is speak to those anxieties speak to those fears. Now, do I think he has solutions? No, I do not. Um, but but he at least gives a mouthpiece to those fears, prejudices, and anxieties. So let's take the next step here, because the the two things are going to happen of significance. One will be the sentencing in Trump's right. case, <clears throat> and then the the second part is, and in you know the way the polls are going, the the distinct possibility of a second Trump presidency. So. If he is sentenced, and I keep hearing that nobody really is going to go to jail on this, but I, right. I'm never going to say never on any of this That's stuff right. anymore. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, I suggested this others that his conviction alone, it didn't just heat up the core. It has radicalized it to, to an extent where there were people who might have been Republican but didn't really, couldn't abide Trump at all. Right. They have been brought into the fold because of this conviction. Right. I think you're absolutely correct. And what it has done is really energize his base. If Trump can be believed in the 24 to 48 hours after his conviction, he brought in nearly $40 million in campaign, 40 million U.S. dollars in campaign donations. His base is really motivated. Biden's base is not motivated at this point. Uh, and that's going to be one of the big factors across the country. And he has been very, that is he being Trump, has been very successful in using the um, uh, Trump's political problems to say, listen, you've been victimized. I'm a victim. I can identify with you. So he's, he's figured out how to use it to his advantage. Now, what I wonder, and I don't know, after all the way that the Republicans and Trump have been attacking the courts, how does the... Hunter Biden conviction play. Uh, Do they now say, ah, but now the courts actually do work or something like that? I mean, it it just poses an interesting dilemma here because remember, it was the feds that went after, have been going after um, Trump, but they haven't gotten, gotten, they haven't gotten the trial yet. Um, But you now have what? You have the, the conviction by, um, at, at the, um, of Hunter Biden, how does that change the situation? Well, what's interesting to hear, and and as we're talking, I'm seeing the the reaction come up on on CNN here because the conviction has just been announced, um, his guilty verdict that is, and the, the answer from the Republicans is saying, well, you know, he never should have been charged with the gun charge anyway. It was all about tax evasion, and because he had some sweet deal for a plea, uh, he got off the taxes, and that was because they they were trying to favor Biden. So all of a sudden, they have they have they have inadvertently or in a backhanded way again weaponized that verdict in the court. No, I think you're absolutely correct at this point. It poses interesting dilemmas for them in terms of thinking about the Second Amendment and how that plays out in terms of right to bear arms. I also heard a prosecutor say that 
Normally, they would never prosecute somebody like this, but because of the deal fell through, that's why they went to trial. He's just a drug user. He's not a drug dealer. He's he's actually pretty low on the in terms of uh, who they would actually go for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so, and I heard some day, the other day, you know, people talking about well, words matter. Except that every time somebody gets you know spits Joe Biden's words back at them or Trump's words back at them, the the home team is actually yeah, but really what he meant to say was or. Nobody really pays attention to that at any real level. This is really the issue that we're trying to get at. So they, you know, words really don't matter <laughs> clearly yes. when we get into these kinds of conversations. So, but let me take you to the next step though, because, you know, for what you do and what you, how you're watching this, Trump has made it pretty clear that if elected, he's quite happy to use the judicial system as a revenge tool against his enemies. And no. there will be a long list of them. No, you were absolutely correct. I mean, that's sort of his aim at this point. At least he's threatening it to say, I'm going to get even. I am going to um, um, take retribution against all my enemies at this point. And that is something that's characteristically, we would hope, not American. You know, in the sense of saying that you win um, and you basically congratulate the loser. Or if you're the loser, you congratulate the winner and move on. I mean. Trump violated that first norm four years ago by saying it was a stolen election as opposed to congratulating the winner. And now he's in the situation of saying, I've won. I get to do whatever I want to my opponents. To me, that reeks of of what? Of, I hate to use the phrase, you know, non-democratic or third world countries or something like that. But that's what it reeks of. So where's the check there? Because the, I, if he is, you know, if he's got the keys to the kingdom and he can run the, the the Justice Department the way he wants to, what's to stop him? Well, what we're hoping we have to hope for is the concept of separation of powers and that Democrats retain at least one branch or at least one of the houses or something. Uh, but if he gets sort of everything that he wants, remember back in 2016, he uh, he had the House and the Senate and the presidency. Those first few months, he moved a lot of stuff, um, and it wasn't until um, he started to over overreach. And it wasn't also what I would say. He was not a good student of American politics and didn't understand how to move levers of power. I think we're hearing rumors at this time. Uh, the Heritage Foundation is working with him and others. He may be a more effective at doing what he wants to do this time because he's learned from his previous presidency, we think, what not to do. And he's also got more minions around him who are willing to support him and who are capable of doing exactly what you're talking about, whether it's taking the heat for the the, the legislative um, agenda or pursuing it. No, he, he has even more loyal supporters now, both in Congress and, I'd say, among the American public than he did before, which makes him potentially more influential. So if the convictions don't really move the needle, don't matter one way or the other, whether it's Hunter Biden's or Donald Trump's, there's a debate plan for the end of June hosted by CNN. I don't see how this is going to make any difference in terms of Voter turnout, voter pattern, voter preference. It might help CNN that night, but I, I, debates have almost become irrelevant. That's right. Yeah. What we're looking again. Remember, we're talking about five or state, five or six swing states that are going to decide the election. You know, the Arizonas, Georgias, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Nevada, and I've been arguing for several months. It's going to come down to about 200,000 voters across those six states. Is the public opinion or is it, are the debates going to move large numbers of people? Unlikely. What we need, to, what needs to happen is moving what? Of a couple thousand votes in one state, 10,000 votes in another. But the people who you want to move are the people who are not paying attention to politics. The people who are paying attention, they, they've made up their mind. Trump versus Biden at this point. So, and the people who are have not made up their mind, they're not following politics. They're not watching. They're not going to watch the debate. And so to a large extent, I agree. I don't I don't. The only thing that I see really changing the political needle between now 
um, and an election day bring back to what we talked about before some small shifts in the economy that might make people feel better or something like that. But I also think that the public has largely made up their mind about the economy. Polls are indicating now that Biden's approval rating has reached the lowest level so far. Uh, he's got a long path to turn around if he wants to um, turn around his fortunes. Again, polls are suggesting he's gotten a little bit of a bump maybe from the convictions, but that just could be what? Random polling error. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will have to laugh. Everybody's breathlessly reporting on these shifts in the polls since the conviction, and it's gone from 49.50 to 50.49, but then the margin of error is three and a half points. So yeah. it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. I mean, to me, it'd be no different than saying I'd go hang out on some street corner in Toronto and ask the first 50 people what they think, and then ask the second 50 people what they think. We're going to get slight variations. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and so I, it'll all um, play out and uh, we'll be, uh, again, I, I say this without being glib or trivializing it, but it, we're almost at the point where in terms of the behavior of Trump, I don't know whether or not the United States is more or less safe, if I want to use that word, um, or stable with a Trump win or a Trump loss. It's a great question here, because if he loses, many of us are anticipating significant protest and unrest. If he wins, there's going to be lots of people um, disappointed. But the, the global churning that will result also. Either way, November 5th and the, d the days following it, leading up to what, January 20th, 2025, no matter how you look at it, it's going to be a uh, a tumultuous two months. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, it's always good to have your insights, David. Thanks for joining us. And we know you're back on the road soon, so safe travels. My pleasure. And we'll just have to close this by saying maybe next year for Toronto and for the Rangers. <laughs> and go Oilers. <laughs> go Oilers. That's exactly it. Yes, let's go Oilers. Thanks to David Schultz, professor of political science, and uh, constitutional law at Hamlin University. And just by the way, before you go, just to remember, keep an eye on the feed because there is going to be a now and next extra this week. Uh, as mentioned, General Clancy has some thoughts on the how and why Ottawa does and doesn't spend on increased contributions to NATO, one. And David Schultz goes more in-depth on how the international community and international allies to the United States are bracing for and preparing for the eventuality of, well, yeah, another Trump presidency. So that will do it for us here on Now and Next. This is the flagship podcast for Story Studio Network. And just a reminder, Friday means On the Ledge Day. So we'll be back in your feed with John Wright and Keith Leslie. Yes, the legislature has risen for 19 weeks. Okay, 18 now since it started last week. Not back in business, not back in the legislature until October the 21st. Still plenty to talk about. So we will get to some of that and more. So join us tomorrow on On the Ledge, your Ontario politics podcast, right here on Story Studio Network. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Now and next is Story Studio Network's flagship podcast, produced by our chief executive producer, Dave Trafford, and supported by our entire SSN team, including... Our senior producers, Becky Coles and Jen Hudson. Our technical producer and audio editor, Mike Trutler. Jamie Nickerson is our production manager. And our sonic logo designer is Greg McDonald. Also, I'm Aaron Trafford, <laughs> queen of the universe. And that's all I have to say about that. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. This is SSN. Story Studio Network.